am because I can't see anybody's faces, but that's not important because what I'm here to talk about today is my journey. And it's a journey that took me from the kitchen to the market. And through telling you my story of my journey, I hope to inspire you to find your passion and to give it a purpose. And the reason why I think you need to do that in your life is because people who do that, who have a passion and give their passion purpose, are fully self-expressed. And people who are fully self-expressed are happy. Now, our parents, regardless of what they say to us and, um, you know, how they shape what they say, what the, how they speak to us, Really, the only thing that a parent wants for their children in their life is to be happy. They really don't care which school you go to or which university you graduate from or what job you get or how much money you end up making or not making or whatever like that. As long as really at the end of the day you're happy, that's, what they, that's really all they can ask for. That's what you know, gives a parent purpose. So, but it's your job to be happy. Nobody can make you happy. So a way to get happy is to discover what is your passion and give it a purpose. So my passion is food. I like to eat food. I like to talk about food. I like to read about food. I like to find out about food. I like to see how it ticks. I like to know what's inside it, where it comes from, who made it, who didn't make it, how it grew. I like to know how the molecules go together. I mean, I am really nerdy when it comes to food. And it is a passion of mine because it's just, I am compelled by it. And by the way, when I speak about passion, that's what I mean. What is it, what subject, what thing gets you excited, Beca taps into an emotion, whether it makes you angry or makes you happy or whether you can't stop talking about it, that's what you're passionate about. Closely second to food, is because you know what goes in has to kind of be expressed outward and um, closely related to my food passion is my passion for being well and healthy so that I can enjoy my life quality of life starts with how well you feel who has a great day when they don't feel well okay great <laughs> one person <laughs> right so you know, health, if you don't have your health, then really the quality of your life, the quality of your experience of life, it's kind of less than optimal. So you have to stay well in your life. It's, it's like a responsibility, as well as you can manage. And a close third to those two passions of mine is to make a difference to people. That's another way that I feel like I'm being engaged in my world, is if I can reach out there and make a difference to somebody. So with these two um, closely related passions being food and health, I've done lots of research and reading and kind of, you know, it's you know, not a lot of um, formal education in it, I might add, but just because it's a hobby of mine, I'm just really interested in food. But I came to realize that actually your life, your longevity is directly correlated to the number of calories you consume. It's been scientifically proven. So in other words, there's only so many calories that you can eat in your life and stay well. You can eat a lot of calories and keep eating them, but you might not stay well. And it may not be obvious. A lot of skinny people are not well, and you wouldn't know it. A lot of chubby people sparkly, sprinkly clean on the inside. In their, in their arteries and blood systems and muscles and everything else. So it may not be obvious. So, but the problem is that we really have a dilemma, and that is that our food choices, you know, when you go and you find food to eat, are pretty scary. Most of them have been a long, long time before they were growing in the ground. Even the corn in the, in the tortilla that you ate, when was it last growing in the ground? It probably sat in a shelf as flour for a long, long time, since then, so it was processed to do that. 
Um, and then it was made in tortilla and frozen or stayed on a shelf for a long, long time before it even got to your mouth. So but that's the system that we live in. The food system is really, and it's not just this country, okay? It's just the way that it kind of is. But it's particularly scary in this country. We, there's a lot of processed foods, and those are the choices that we, that, we, that we have. And the other problem that we have is that we don't have the time. We don't have the time to do food. We're so busy doing everything else. We're studying, we're working, we're raising our children, we're doing our sports, we're living our lives. We don't have time to do food the way, you know, thousands of years ago people had to do food. And, may, you know, as a result, we're not skilled in doing food. You know, you might go to the supermarket and get, go to the farmer's market and buy all the wonderful fruits and vegetables and get home and go, now what? You don't know what to do with it. So what do we do? We go to done food prepared food, processed food. And the, the stabilizers and additives and preservatives and enhancers, because once you've processed something, then you've got to put stuff back in it, like flavor, color. Okay, so there's all these additives that they put back into the food after they process it so that it was done for you. Not to mention, which is a whole other topic and a whole other speech that I'm really passionate about, which I won't introduce except by this little byline, that a lot of the flavor enhancing and preservatives are with salt and sugar, which actually should be right up there with cocaine in controlled substances. For the effect that they have on the human organism, I'll just put that right out there. So, salt and sugar, major no-nos. But there we are. It's in everything that we eat, and we're not even aware of it. And actually... Um, the end result of all of these food choices is they're making us sick. Heart disease, adult onset diabetes, hypertension, which is an, directly leads to stroke. These are the leading causes of death in this country. Over half of our population is sick. They either have diabetes or heart disease or they're hypertensive. And they're eat, you know, and it's small wonder because you go to the supermarket and what you, you go to the supermarket and what is there to choose? All the things that I just mentioned. And but like the supermarket is kind of like our textbooks. You know? You study the textbooks and you study, you know, that's the knowledge. It's supposed to be right. It's in the textbook, so it's okay. It's right. Go to the supermarket and that's what there is. So it must be okay. It must be right. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. It's just kind of the, the path that we've, we've been put on and where we...
And the problem with not really being aware of this issue is that people are on autopilot. You know, we're kind of unconscious about, um, about this. You know, so some of us might go, okay, well, they read a textbook and they say, well, um, this, isn't, uh, this doesn't jive. So they might pick up it over in another textbook. But that's one in a very few people. So the way I have dealt with this dilemma is that I do read the labels. I'm really conscious about what I choose to eat. I'm really picky, and I'm really weird. I'm really weird, and I have to be really OK with being weird. It takes courage to be uncommon. It takes courage to be not among the flow, the stream, the drift, to stick up and say, wait a minute, this doesn't work, this doesn't add up to me. That takes courage to do that. So the day that my journey started from kitchen to market was the day that I was in a supermarket looking for something to eat, and I found a bag of green stuff. And I read the label, and based on what the label described, first of all, it was green, so I thought we were in a, right, and it was really green, it wasn't made green. Um, it was pretty compelling. I opened the bag and I devoured it right there. I was so excited and so turned on by this. It was really an amazing snack food in a bag in the supermarket and it was green and, it was, and the, the list of ingredients was like five items long and they were all real food except the last one was salt so that made me kind of nervous but there we go, kind of everything. And I had to get more and I couldn't get more so what did I do? I took the label home and I reverse engineered it. I figured it out and I played and, I, and it worked and I just because I wanted to have this food and it was dried kale. It was dried kale. That's not dried kale. That's fresh kale. Has anybody ever seen it before? Where have you seen it? In your friend's backyard. Yeah, grows like a weed. Where else have you seen it? At the farmer's market. Okay, where else might you have seen it? How about on the sushi bar? You know, it's like decorating the sushi bar or the salad bar. Yeah, it's used as decoration and then they do what? They throw it away. They don't eat it. Do you know that kale is the most densely nutritious leafy green vegetable that there is? The most nutrition per calorie right there, right in this stuff. And not everybody likes it though, and that's kind of a problem because everybody needs to get kale in their life. Or it's close seconds, bok choy, watercress, spinach is a down there. But kale is so powerful that they index the scale with it. 1,000 points is the index of the scale, and that's where kale lives. So there I was in my kitchen making this fresh kale into a dehydrated, a dried kale chip. And I played, and I tweaked, and I had a ball, and I added a bit of this, and I threw in a bit of that, and I took out some of the other, but I only used real food. I only used, and even the salt that I used was pink. <laughs> That's how weird I was. But I was going to use salt because you actually do need to have a little bit in the culinary art to sort of balance the sweetness of whatever it is you might have in there. But I used pink Himalayan salt, the most unprocessed salt that I could find, and the tiniest amount that I could get away with. And I tweaked and played. And lo, and why did I do it? For me. I did it for me because I wanted to have a snack food that I could go to in a hungry moment that wasn't going to like, you know, make me feel awful for what I was eating. And because I wanted to serve my family. And in the meanwhile, everybody else was trying it and saying, Rachel, you should sell this stuff. And there was my opportunity. That was the day that my opportunity woke up. It was November of 2008. And I had an opportunity to give purpose to my passion. And I, 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 I could make a difference to people and I could make a buck. That's you know, kind of like a throw in extra. You know, get to give purpose to my passion, make a difference to people, and maybe make a cent or two in the market. So here I had a goal. I wanted to be in the farmer's market. That was my goal. Um, and why did I want to go to the farmer's market? Because it's grassroots. People, I get to talk to people, educate people. You know, not many people know about eating kale. They want to do other things with it, like just, you know, decorate their salad bar, but they needed to understand. It's green, weird stuff. It looks like you're supposed to stick it in a pipe and smoke it. But not when, not when I'm standing around, please. Take it home and do that. 
But uh, yeah. So um, also because it was of me, I get to be self-expressed. I get to be excited. People get to get lit up and and uh, and um, feel my passion about it. You know, it's like hello. We got to make different choices, and there aren't any other choices to make, so let's try maybe this one. So that's where the real work started. People started to get excited. There was a growing demand, and then there was the uh oh. Then there was the oh oh. Because I was already busy. I was already a really busy person. I'm a fitness instructor, I teach jazzercise, I have a family. I have other, you know, pursuits, and yet this, this, this thing that started to, could possibly take over my life. And I knew that I was, I had to set limits. And I'm the kind of person who, it's like all or nothing. If I'm going to do something, I give it my all. But I've come a lot, I've been around the block enough times to know that that really kind of doesn't work. I've tried to give it my all and collapsed in lots of other areas of my history. So I knew that, and I was not willing to sacrifice my family. I was not willing to sacrifice myself and the quality of my family relationships for, for this business. So that's kind of it draws to a point that I'm going to make um, in a minute. So my goals were kind of third. I had a goal to go to the farmer's market, but it was kind of in third place. But what I needed to get to my goal was, did I going to fill in the blank? What did I need money. in my busy life? I needed money. Okay, let's say that that wasn't such an issue. Uh, time. time. Okay, so there's only so much time. There's only so many calories you can eat and there's only so much time you can get. No, I had a lot of passion. What else did I need? I needed? I needed help. I needed help. I, there's, you, cannot do, you cannot get to where you want to get to without help. It's why you're in school. Did you know that? You didn't know that? You're, in, you're at school to get help, to get wisdom, to get knowledge, to have goals, get excited, and understand that you need people around you to help you get to where you want to be. So there I was, I had a little luck, okay, I have this phenomenal husband right here in the front row, and he was with me. He said, Rachel, you go, girl, and, and, and you know, he said, whatever it takes, you know, and, I, he, and, and he didn't know. He didn't know what he was getting himself into. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm kitchen, the kids, you got kids. Okay, all kids. So he, he really helped me, so that was really lucky. I also have a family that's in a situation where, it, you know, I didn't have to be so, so involved with my kids. Um, and I enrolled a commercial kitchen lady who ran a, a, a restaurant, and I enrolled her into letting me lease space from her. So a couple of things that I got lucky with. But still I was working alone. I was in the kitchen. I was tweaking, and I worked. I worked hell for leather. All the hours, I was super stressed out. I really was passionate about and I had this drive, got to get to market, got to get to market. Remember, I'm an all or nothing person. Gray is really hard for me. But it's not sustainable and this is where I, my second mantra, fundamentalist anything is never a good thing. A little bit of gray is okay. Got to get help, got to get help. So today, here it is, I've been in market two years, I employ uh, two full-time people, five part-time people, I'm in five markets a week, and I'm doing less, because I got help. I got helpers. So key takeaways that I'd like to leave you with is, find your passion and give it purpose. If it's not obvious yet, there, it'll come. There are many solutions to giving it purpose. Um, Follow an organic path, and struggling is not allowed. Struggling is a flag.
to frustration and, it will, and it's a flag to limits, get help. No, you're not supposed to be alone or go it alone or do it alone. And finally, eat well. Thank you so much for listening to me. Be well in your lives. Thank you.